So if you have your Bible, go ahead and find Acts chapter 1. Uh, we are closing out our series that we've been calling The Creed of Christmas this morning. Uh, so I know it's the new year. We're so, still talking about Christmas, but Christmas is important enough to talk about all year long because it's whenever Christ took on flesh and came into the world. Now, uh, we've called this the Creed of Christmas, and each week we've kind of been walking through the Nicene Creed, uh, this creed that um, different, you know, people in the church came together in 325 and said uh, to protect the church at large from heresy and from division. We want to come together, even with some differing views on maybe second or third or fourth tier issues, and establish the main things, the, the core doctrines of what we believe, uh, not to, to create those, but to say, hey, this is what we're affirming together, that the church has always believed what the Bible has always taught. And so uh, they came together and did that. Now, here's one of the stories that uh, kind of floats around whenever you talk about the Nicene Creed that a, a lot of people don't know. Now, I'll give you a, a little warning ahead of time. I have no idea if this story is factually correct, um, but it, it's a good story to tell uh, in the sense that it's interesting, okay? So there was this bishop uh, who was born in 270, and uh, then he became a bishop, Bishop of Myra, in 317. Uh, so Nicene Creed took place in 325, 317, and this bishop's name was Nicholas. Um, and so Nicholas, he, you know, was this bishop, was very generous, and uh, on one occasion even took some gifts and, you know, gold coins and those kind of things to this family that was in great need. And so, you know, Nicholas was this great guy. And uh, many people say that Nicholas, uh, as he would later be known, Saint Nicholas, uh, was at the at the establishment of the Nicene Creed, wherever they all came together at the Council of Nicaea. And uh, they, they came together, and the main issue was that there was this guy named Arius who had been saying that Jesus was not the Son of God, equal with God the Father, and equal with the Holy Spirit. This guy, Arius, was saying that, you know, Jesus was created, uh, that he was, you know, uh, just another part of God's creation, important, yes, but not truly the eternal, preexistent Son of God. Well, as folklore has it, as, you know, the story goes, um, St. Nicholas got so upset that Arius was saying this that he stood up and, he, and overwhelmed with emotion, ended up punching Arius in the face. Um, now, I don't know if that's true or not. Like, it, you know, historically, he wasn't actually cited to be there until like several hundred years after it happened. But here's my point. If Christology and the creed of Nicaea is important enough to get Santa Claus to punch somebody in the face. It's worth uh, four weeks of a sermon series. Um, so, sorry, there's my, my poor setup into, all right, let's dive in. Now, now here's what's going to happen over the time that we have. Uh, I want to walk through just kind of the, the four different stanzas that we've been looking at in uh, the Nicene Creed. And then we're going to do something I've never done before. We're going to jump into not one, but three key texts, all right? Now, I recognize everybody stayed up late last night. We got a lot going on. So think of these more as like three devotions as, as we kind of think about who Christ is, what, um, not only what Christ has done, uh, what Christ is doing right now, and then what Christ will one day do when he returns. Um, and so with all that being said, let's look again just at the Christology specifically that is established in uh, the Nicene Creed. Now, this is um, a, a three-part creed, if you will, focusing on the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, but for our purposes, we're just going to focus on what it says about the Son specifically. All right, so this is what this creed says. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death, and was buried. And then this is what we're going to talk about today. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
Now, as you see that, you can kind of see what we've done with, you know, the, this four-part sermon series. First week, we looked on uh, how Christ is eternally pre-existent. Uh, the second week, we looked at his humanity. Last week, uh, Jimmy talked about the suffering and death of Christ as, or two weeks ago, as our substitution. Who He took on flesh, became our substitute from cradle to cross, accomplishing the work of salvation. Uh, he who was born to die and to to rise again. And the, today we're going to focus on uh, what took place after the resurrection, the ascension, the current reign and rule of Christ, his intercession and his return. Now, why is this so important? I think often whenever we think about, you know, the work of Christ, uh, especially around Christmas time, we think about the incarnation, that he is eternally preexistent, the word became flesh. And that deserves our full attention. Whenever, whenever we think about Christmas, whenever we think about the incarnation in general and what Christ has done, that deserves to be one of, one of the highlights. I think often whenever we think about the work of Christ, most of us, uh, especially whenever we're talking about like what is the gospel, we tend to lean more toward the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Uh, so what took place? Well, uh, Christ took on our sin, then he imp- Imputed his perfect righteousness to us to declare us righteous. And, you know, then we kind of almost picture the death and resurrection of Christ as like two sides of the same coin. Uh, so, you know, right after Good Friday, Easter Sunday happens. And so, you know, we focus on, all right, this is all that Christ has done. And then if you're a student of the Bible, you know, you, you often at least reference the second coming of Christ as in, you, you know, all that Christ has done. And one day this is what he will do. But that kind of leaves you wondering, all right, now, how do, I, how do I think about Christ right now? Whenever I think about my current walk with Jesus, what, what am I thinking about in regards to his current action? In regard to uh, what he's accomplishing or applying in regard to what he's accomplished? I mean, picture it like this. Um, let's say... You're going off to college, you're a college student, and uh, you, know, you have great loving parents, and they're helping you move in, and they bring all the boxes into your dorm room and set them down, and they're like, all right, uh, just so you know, everything's paid for. We've completely covered your tuition. We've got it, you know, direct withdrawal. Every time a tuition payment for a semester comes due, we'll cover it. We'll cover your books. Like we've got everything paid for in advance. Um, and, you know, we're, we're really excited about graduation day. We look forward to being able to see you walk across that stage and uh, get the degree that, that you're going to work so hard for. And so we'll talk to you then. And then they just walk out and you now, that would, that would be kind of like, all right, like, what's going on? Like, I'm really grateful that uh, you've accomplished everything needed for me to, to live the next four years. Like, that's very generous and kind. Everything's going to be paid for. Um, and, and then you think, well, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day that, uh, you know, we get to catch up and I can tell them about, you know, uh, my sophomore and junior semester. I'm looking forward to telling them about the co-op that I have and, you know, but, but what's missing that the, in the in-between, you're like, well, how, what is this relationship like? I mean, are, are they thinking about me? And, I mean, have they, you know, did they go home and immediately turn my bedroom into like a home gym or like a movie like room? Like, what, like what's going on? Are they, are they still concerned about me? And while I think that's, you know, that's a crazy analogy to think that that would happen in the real world, I think many of us, if we're not careful, we begin to operate like that when it comes to the work of Christ. And we think, oh, you know, Christ he took on flesh. He left his throne. I mean, we just sang about that. He left his throne from heaven to, to come and be like lonely, lowly, born in a manger to take on just the frailty of flesh and uh, then lives this perfect life, accomplishes everything needed in his death and he's resurrected and then he ascends to heaven. And then now we're kind of like, all right, we know he's going to return one day. He promises to make all things new. But what do we do kind of in the in-between? And, and that's where I think this sermon perhaps is so helpful, maybe to not go super in depth on a lot of things, but just kind of give you a really uh, healthy view of biblical Christology. Like what does the Bible say about what Christ is currently doing uh, it, as he has ascended back to his throne, as he intercedes for us on his throne as the ruling and reigning king, and as we await his return. So uh, to summarize everything that we're going to talk about in a single sentence, I'll give you this. Christ is the exalted king 
who reigns eternally, intercedes for us, and will one day return. So Christ is the exalted king who reigns eternally, intercedes for us, and will one day return. Now it's taken out of the last uh, six lines of that creed. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. First doctrine I want us to focus on is the ascension of Christ. This is Christ's exaltation. What happens in the ascension of Christ? Uh, After Christ has given the Great Commission, when he promises the Holy Spirit, what, what, what does that actually mean for us? Well, let's look at Acts 1, verses 1 through 11. This is really the go-to text for understanding uh, what happened 40 days after Christ's resurrection. Now, you'll have to know that Luke is writing the book of Acts. He kind of did like a two-volume work. So Luke and Acts is kind of volume one and two of uh, these books that Luke was compiling for a guy named Theophilus, who's really kind of funding this project to tell the story of Jesus and the early church. And so let's look at verse one in Luke or in Acts one. It says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, we also see in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, that Paul talks about the resurrection of Christ and how over uh, 500 people saw Christ resurrected for 40 days. He went around preaching and teaching, proving uh, that he indeed was bodily resurrected. Now, verse 4 It says, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. Now, that's interesting, right? He he has this global mission. He's going to tell them to go to all the ends of the earth. But he says, now wait, stay in Jerusalem. Why? Pick up with me right there after the comment. It says, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The narrative uh, begins in verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven... As he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, what do we see here? After the resurrection, uh, Jesus is uh, teaching about the kingdom for 40 days, and then he speaks to his disciples. And uh, as they are, you know, he says, I'm, I'm going to send the promised Holy Spirit. Uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Uh, you'll be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, why is this so important? Because whenever he is explaining, uh, you know, that he is about to leave, they ask him, they said, well, Lord, is it this time that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? This whole time he's been talking about how his kingdom is not of this world. The the issue here is not that their view of God's kingdom was too small or too big. It's that really their view of God's kingdom was too small. He's saying this is a kingdom that is going to reach to the end of the earth, and they just kind of miss it. Now, what I want you to see before we even focus on the ascension here is the patience of Christ. I mean, he, he's been teaching them, walking with them for three years. They've seen his resurrection. They've heard him post-resurrection teach about the kingdom of God for 40 days. And then they say, well, is it this time that you're going to completely restore kind of this political power here on earth? He's saying, no, my, my kingdom is much bigger than that. You almost wonder if at this point in the story, Jesus is just going to say, all right, you know, let's find like 11 new guys. Because if this hasn't taken at this point, like this just isn't going to work. But Jesus is really patient with us, isn't he? I mean, I see myself in this story as one of those 11 guys that 
would have been like, all right, like now, like now is like, are, are my dreams going to come true? Is, is this the part where my life gets way easier because I've been following you? Like, how can I insert myself into this grand narrative here that I want to make all about me? And yet here we see Jesus is so patient. One of the, uh, one of the quotes that I love from uh, a biblical counselor named Paul David Tripp, he says, in his patience, God gives ample time for his grace to do its transforming work. Let that sink in for a moment. So in his patience, God gives ample time for his grace to do its transforming work. Jesus doesn't expect instantaneous maturity in your life. The whole process of sanctification in your walk with Christ is to cultivate dependence upon Christ. The whole walk of sanctification and and daily growth, which includes uh, being, as the Proverbs says, the righteous man who falls down seven times and gets up again, is learning what it means to have to abide in Christ. And which actually makes a lot of sense out of what Jesus is going to to say next. He's going to say, "I'm, I'm leaving, but I'm giving you the presence of the Holy Spirit. The, you're going you're gonna to know your nearness to me even better than you have walking with me for the past three years. And this gift of the Holy Spirit is the same gift that we now receive as Christians to experience the patient, gracious, daily, new morning mercy type of transforming grace that God gives And I think that's so essential for us to realize, maybe specifically as we're starting the new year. And some of us are thinking, well, you know, should I grab another 2023 reading plan or should I just pick up 2022 in Leviticus where I trailed off? Uh, Maybe some of us are thinking, you know, I remember whenever I dropped that, you know, name into the, into the baptismal, you know, when it was empty last year and I said, you know, I, Lord, help me to be bold enough to have a spiritual conversation with a family member or friend that doesn't know Christ. And I just never worked up the nerve. Like maybe some of us are sitting there thinking like, you know, I, I've kind of said, I, this is something I want to change this year. And I really have no idea it, like, like how long I'm going to make it. And here we, we kind of overhear this conversation between Jesus and his disciples, or even just get the chance to look at the way he interacts with them. And he's, he's patient. And it's a reminder to us that in his patience, God gives ample time. He, he, he allows us uh, the ability to be transformed by his daily renewing grace. And, and part of failure is even becoming more dependent, more reliant on Christ and realizing that we in ourselves are insufficient. Now the story continues, and what happens? Well, as, as Christ is talking to them, um, his feet begin to hover uh, above the ground, and then, you know, they're, they're trying to comprehend all that he has just said in receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, and then he just floats up into the clouds. And as you would imagine, exactly how we would be in that moment, he's just, I mean, they're just kind of like looking up like awestruck, like what just happened? And then these two angels appear and they say, men of Galilee, like why are you looking up at the sky? Don't you know that Christ will return in the same way that he ascended? He's gonna come back through the clouds again. Basically, there are things to be done during this time that, that you have in between Christ's first coming and his second coming. So what implications does the ascension have on us that Christ ascended into heaven? Well, uh, first, one of the things that we see is that Christ maintained his physical body, that Christ is both God and man, even now in heaven, even seated at the right hand of God, that he has a physical body. Uh, Think about that. that. That means that you and I, whenever we are in heaven, we too will be embodied. We will have a physical body, a resurrected, glorified body as Christ who has gone before us has. But we also see that in his ascension, this isn't just Christ returning home. This is the exaltation of Christ. This is Christ taking the throne that he rightly deserves, that he alone deserves as the king over all creation. Think about that for a moment, that Christ rules over all things, that he is seated at the right hand of God the Father even now, 
that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Now, why does that matter so much? Well, because if we were to get a glimpse into the throne room of God right now, we would hear myriads upon myriads of angels crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, worshiping around his throne because he is worthy of it. And how often do we pray? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That we, that our hearts would have that kind of posture of worship. Now, constantly, whenever we think about how we're talking, how we're loving others, uh, whenever we think about the way we spend our free time or the priorities that we have or the way we plan our schedule, is that an act of worship that reflects that Christ is not only on the throne of heaven, but throned in our hearts, that he is worthy of all worship. This is a great comfort as well, that Christ is seated on the throne right now. I know that for for many, the past couple weeks have been full of joy, and for many, they've been very difficult. Um, Two two of our church members said goodbye to uh, parents this past Christmas, and uh, I, I mean, it's that... What, what can you say to console someone who loses a loved one? What hope is there whenever you're thinking, you know, this, this has been the hardest week of my life. And here, this passage, focusing on the ascension of Christ for just a brief moment, enables us to inhale, recognizing the grief and the difficulty and the unexpected pain and to exhale and say, Christ is seated on his throne. He is sovereign over it all. And I don't understand it. There's a lot of confusion. There's still a lot of feelings to, to work out in the presence of God. And at the same time, God's on his throne. Christ is on his throne even now. What a comfort that is to see that he has ascended and is seated on high. I also think that here, whenever we look at a passage like this, We see that in Christ going to heaven that he also sends the Holy Spirit. That's what he says, that we would be his witnesses as we have received the Holy Spirit. What a gift that Christ can declare in the Great Commission, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And how can he do that? In John 16, 7, he says, it is to your benefit that I would go so that I would send the helper with you. I mean, during Christ's uh, you know, mission on earth in his incarnation. Uh, he, was, he was one place in his human nature at one time. And he says, whenever I go, I can, I can send the Holy Spirit and he will be with all believers in all places at all times. And what we see is that this is, this is how the, the nature of Christ is present with us as a result of his ascension. This is a great comfort to us. And then, and then what happens we see that the church is born and the church multiplies. I mean, you know, to use an example just from, you know, our modern world, uh, two years after Steve Jobs passed away, the CEO and, you know, innovator of Apple, the stock price was 44% down from its all-time high, all right? So things got progressively worse after he died. What happens two years after Christ's death? Well, I mean, Christianity is rapidly spreading throughout the known world. Why is that? Because Christ didn't stay dead. Because he raises to life, he ascends and sends the Holy Spirit to empower and enable the mission that he left his people with. I think it's interesting to note that as you read Luke 1 and 2 and Acts 1 and 2, there are these beautiful parallels with the work of the Holy Spirit, what he does, and then this birth of new life. You see that, you know, an angel appears to Mary and, you know, he says, the Holy Spirit is going to indwell you. You are going to have a child and he will be God with us. And then in Acts 1, what do you see? Christ comes. He says, I'm going to give the Holy Spirit to you, that that the Holy Spirit will dwell in you and that the church will be born. Acts 1 and 2 show us the way that the Holy Spirit comes and dwells. And then there's this birth that changes everything. The birth of Christ in Luke 1 and 2 and the birth of the church in Acts 1 and 2. Through Christ's ascension, uh, we see that he takes his throne, that he sends his spirit, and that the church is born. 
That now the presence of Christ is with us even now. The the next thing that we see as an aspect of Christ's ascension is his intercession, that he daily pleads for us. Which brings us to the second passage that we will look at, Hebrews 7, 23 through 28. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and find Hebrews 7, 23 through 28. Now this is the intercession. This is Christ's work eternally applied. Now think about maybe a, um, you know, a TV show that you've watched or a movie where there's just, you know, kind of this big, uh, you know, courtroom scene. Maybe it's the pinnacle and, you know, there's just been this case kind of working through the entire movie and evidence is being, you know, submitted on both sides. You're just kind of like, what's going on? And then it comes to, you know, that moment where the lawyer is going to give their closing argument. So uh, the lawyer, you know, stands up and they're, you know, just kind of making their case. And, you know, what do they say at the very end? They say, I rest my case. And then they sit down. It's just kind of this big moment. Or, you know, maybe you think about, um, like, just daily life. So, uh, maybe you're a mom who, you know, is constantly, you know, taking care of your kids, and you're like, all right, I, you know, I got to get up before my kids and uh, pack all the lunches, and then make sure that, you know, we get teeth brushed on, you know, all that kind of stuff, shoes on the right feet before we head out the door to school, we get everybody dropped off at school, um, you know, got errands to run, things to do around the house, then, you know, go pick the kids up, and, you uh, you know, you're like, man, and it's bedtime, bath time before you know it. And after 14 hours, you just kind of like sink into the couch. Now, what is being communicated in both cases by sitting? It's not just a change of posture or position. It, it is a sign of work that has been completed. And what are we told in that passage that Charlotte read earlier in Hebrews 1? That after making purification for sins... Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father. That his work is finished. That his work is complete on our behalf. And so what does he do now? Now he applies the work that he accomplishes through his intercession. You know, the entire theme of the book of Hebrews, as Jimmy said last week, is that Jesus is better. Well, the case that is being made in Hebrews chapter 7 is that Jesus is better than the Old Testament priests that went before him because they were simply a type or a shadow of what he would ultimately accomplish in his death on our behalf and how he would daily apply it for our benefit. Look at verses 23 through 28, chapter 7. It says, The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the utter, uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. What do we see here? That Christ is not like the former priests. Why not? Uh, Because he doesn't have to atone for his own sin first, make a sacrifice, and then make a sacrifice for others. No, we see that he, being completely holy and unstained, unblemished, completely sinless, is able to offer a once-for-all sacrifice on behalf of his people. The former priest could never do that. What else do we learn? That he is a priest forever. Because he is eternal, He can offer eternal life. No priest could do that. They only served for a temporary amount of time because they were finite human beings. What does this mean for us? Whenever we read that Christ can save to the uttermost, that word uttermost that you find there in uh, verse 25 has kind of a dual meaning in the Greek. It, It connotes both completion, that Christ has completely accomplished the work, saying it is finished. There's nothing else that you need to do in addition to the work of Christ to be saved, but simply to receive that as a gift by faith. But it also has an eternal duration. It's saying there's no expiration date on the salvation of Christ. 
and he applies this work forever. That gives us great confidence to approach the throne of God. And and I don't know about you, um, but I know for me in my own life, whenever there are things that I'm like, hey, this is really an act of obedience um, that I know the Lord has called me to do and whatever, I just kind of turn the other way. I don't feel super confident to approach the throne of God. But whenever there is a sin that I'm struggling with, whenever I'm like bitter with someone, like my prayer life is just not doing great in that moment. I'm not, you know, it's like, I'm a little more reluctant to go to my Bible and to have a devotional time whenever I feel like, you know, I've, I've really messed up the day before. And yet here, according to Hebrews 7, your confidence to approach the throne of God, the millisecond after you have committed a sin does not come from the action that took place but what Christ is currently doing in the heavens on your behalf. That in the moment that you feel like you really blew it, or, or in the moment where you feel like, you know what, look at me, like I'm, I'm unlovable, that, that if you could somehow see into the heavens, you would hear Christ praying on your behalf. Like imagine how your life would be different if, if you could, if, if, you know, I mean, if someone could share like a clip right now of Jesus praying for you and you could see your name roll off his tongue saying like, Lord, I pray that you would help Terry Lee in the midst of this struggle with sin. Lord, would you make him humble? Would you give him compassion for other people? Would you rip away his self-centered, like, man, if I could, if I could hear Jesus praying some of those things for me, I think I would like just you know, roll into Monday, like fired up. And this passage says that's exactly what Christ is doing. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father and God the Father isn't reluctantly receiving this. God the Father is like, yeah, that's exactly what I sent you to do, to go and redeem these sinners who were once my enemies and make them my children. And now the Son of God is constantly saying, my blood was shed for them. There's nothing else needed So that that cycle of sin that is just perpetuated whenever we lack confidence to approach the throne of God would be snuffed out. That we would look at it and say, you know what, I can't believe that I did that, but it doesn't surprise Christ at all. In fact, that's why he went to the cross and now he's pleading to God the Father on my behalf. He's sent the spirit so that I would walk in the power of his resurrection and now I can actually change in applying the work that Christ has already accomplished. We can't overstate like the significance of the intercession of Christ right now. What is Christ doing right now? He's praying on your behalf. He's applying eternally the work that he has accomplished on your behalf. And that is why he is completely worthy of our worship. There's no greater act of love than this. This is why Augustine said that the cross of Christ was the pulpit in which Christ proclaimed his love to the world. And now he is seated in the heavens constantly saying that that sinner is now a saint. They are forgiven because of my blood. I often think of um, the the conversation that Jesus and Peter had in Luke 22 where, you know, uh, they're talking and I just imagine like what this would be like, but, but Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Think about that for a moment, that Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but don't worry. Why? Not because he says like, but you know the truth and you know, you you have great theology and you know, he says, no, because I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And that is the prayer that Christ prays for us. I mean, like if it wasn't for Christ praying for me, how many times would I have just, you know, done something of just consequences that would be unimaginable? I mean, we could all say that, but it is Christ who holds us fast. And, and through him, we receive this amazing forgiveness. Uh, third and finally, let's look at the second advent of Christ, Christ's return. Uh, you can flip to First Thessalonians just by way of 
set up. I told you guys I'd be all over the place this morning. I appreciate it. Um, your, your patience, that is. Uh, all right, First Thessalonians four thirteen through eighteen. Now, now here's what's going on. Um, the church in Thessalonica was this young church, and they had a lot of questions about the second coming of Christ because they thought um, that Christians who were believers wouldn't die. Well, then what happened is uh, people began to die, and they're like, "Well, you know, what's happening? Like when?" Uh, like, I thought they had eternal life. What's going on here? Well, Paul is writing to them to say, hey, look, it's basically like they are asleep because to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of Christ. Like, let me tell you how Christ is going to return and all that's going to happen here and how this is actually an encouragement to you and should actually, um, you know, cause you to grieve differently than how people who don't know the Lord grieve. So, With that being said, let's look at verse 13. He says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring him those who have fallen asleep. By that he means have died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. What's going to happen? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. All right, so as he talks about the second coming of Christ, he's saying this, this will help you grieve now with great hope. Um, this is a promise that Christ will return, uh, that you can encourage one another with these words, and that Christ will always be with you. He, he also points to the day of judgment. I want to give you a passage from Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, just to describe this. This is John uh, describing the great throne uh, on the day of judgment. He says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dread, great and small, standing, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So this is that section of the creed where we read that Jesus will come, he will return, he will judge the living and the dead, and he will reign eternally. Now, what do we see here is that those who knew Christ are, are judged, and their name is found in the book of life, and they have eternal life in his name. And those who do not know Christ, whenever they are judged, they are found to not be in him, and they suffer eternal conscious torment in a place called hell. Now, whenever you think about the day of judgment, what feelings does that incite? I mean, maybe, maybe whenever you think about the day of judgment, you're, you get like a little fearful, you're like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I'm ready. Like, I don't know if I, like, that, that just seems like a lot. Uh, maybe, maybe some of you just kind of feel like, you know, there are things that I would like to accomplish right now that are on my bucket list that like, I, I don't want the Lord to return right now because I, I still feel like I've got a lot of life to live. Uh, others of you maybe think about family members or friends uh, that, you know, you're, you're like, I don't know if they're ready for the day of judgment. And this kind of causes like a sense of urgency for you. Some of you, you may not be believers. Like this could be your first Sunday in church and you're saying, hey, I want to start this new year by going to a church. And so you came this morning and you're thinking like, well, this is like super weighty. And, and what I want us all to see is that this reality, the truth of Christ's return is an invitation to follow him. If you're not a believer, this is the time that you confess your sins to God and say, I I want Jesus to be king over my life. Like I want to follow him and put my faith in him that I would have eternal life in his name. If if you're a believer, this is both a a sobering reality, the, the urgency we have in this mission, but it's also a great comfort 
that Christ will return, that he will make all things new, that his reign, as it is in heaven, will be fully realized on the earth. The Heidelberg Catechism, this tool that was used, uh, developed in the 1500s to kind of teach doctrine to adults and children, phrases question 52 like this, which I thought was interesting. It says, what comfort is it to thee that Christ shall come again to judge the living and the dead? I, I love the question because I think a lot of us are kind of wondering that, like, what What comfort is this? It says, In all my distress and persecution, I turn my eyes to the heavens and confidently await as judge the very one who has already stood trial in my place before God and so has removed the whole curse from me. No fear. In all my distresses and all my sins, all my failures, I, I know that I will look upon Christ and God the Father will say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because of what Christ has done for us. He's fully received the curse in our place. Not only that, but it also says, all his enemies and mine he will condemn to everlasting punishment, but me and all his chosen ones he will take along with him into the joy and the glory of heaven. I mean, think about that for a moment, that all of Christ's enemies will be conquered. And I think uh, sometimes we don't, we don't really know what to do with that because whenever we think about our enemies, maybe it's like a coworker that always outdoes us or the person that got valedictorian instead of us or, you know, whatever. But whenever we think about the enemies of Christ, I mean, think about the weight of injustice in our world. Think about those who uh, recruit and train child soldiers. Think about uh, the horrendous acts of human trafficking. Like that one day Christ will fully put an end to it all and that sin will be no more, that sin will be rid in the world and in our hearts, that every single one of his enemies will be crushed and that his reign will be fully realized on earth. Think about the fact that we will be in the presence of Christ and the journey of our sanctification will finally reach its designed end. Cancer wings will be no more. Depression, well, I mean, it can be crossed out of the dictionary that one day Christ will return and wipe away every tear and make all things new. And so as, as Christians, we, we look upon the ascension of Christ and see that he's enthroned as king. We, we cling fast to the current intercession of Christ and we await his second coming. I, I think this changes the way that we live right now. Um, a couple weeks ago, it was December 18th, uh, you may remember the Bengals played the Buccaneers. And, you know, I grew up Floridian, and so I have always been a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan. That's a football team, for those of you who don't know. Um, So so I've always pulled for the Buccaneers. And, um, you know, it was, it was difficult to choose between Buccaneers or Bengals on the 18th. Actually, our family was divided a little bit, um, so our boys were kind of torn. But we were like, we like to pull for the home team because, you know, our neighbors shoot off fireworks. We, you know, love to wear black and orange and uh, even crying with, you know, the rest of Cincinnati when we lose. Like, that's, that's all fun for us. Um, and so, you know, we were watching the game. Bedtime for our boys took place around like third quarter, like beginning of third quarter. And so we're like, all right, well, we'll pause the game. I guess we should be responsible parents and get our kids to bed. And so we did that. Uh, But whenever we paused the game, the score was six to 17. Bengals were down. And so we're like, this doesn't look good, you know, for the Bengals. We're pulling for the Bengals. And, uh, and so anyways, we come back down, you know, 45 minutes later, we turn it on and uh, we're getting like through the third quarter and, you know, they score and things are looking a little bit better, but still not great. Still not looking like maybe the Bengals are going to win it. And then we hear just this loud boom, like next door, like boom, boom, boom. And what has happened? Uh, our neighbors are shooting off fireworks. And so there we were with like five minutes left in the third quarter. And what do I immediately know? the Bengals just won. Like they just secured the W because our neighbors love the Bengals so much and are always shooting off fireworks. Now, what we find is that Revelation 20, that what we find in in this promise of Christ's return acts a lot like those fireworks. That for for the rest of the game, I wasn't worried. I wasn't like thinking like, oh no, it's third and long. Like what's gonna happen? It's just like, it it doesn't matter. Like Like I know that the Bengals are going to win this game. And I think for us, yeah, as we, as we deal with difficulty or whenever we're like, man, what is going on? Like with the injustice in the world or um, we're like, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna figure this out or not, not struggle with some of these 
difficulties this side of heaven that we can look forward to the fact that one day Christ will return and all things will be made new. And we await the return of Christ. With that being said, I want to to just maybe maybe think for a moment, how, how do we live in the meantime? Um, it's more simple than we think. First uh, Peter 4 verses 7 through 9 say this. It says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. There's no mention of building underground bunkers. There's not like this, you know, we should wall ourselves off from the world in this way. No, he says, don't complain. Be hospitable. Love one another. Be self-controlled. Be sober-minded. Saturate yourself in Scripture. He's saying just... Just live as someone who walks with the Lord and and follows him as you await the return of Christ. So perhaps you're not much for resolutions, but here are some suggestions for maybe some habits to either continue or to to have as we think about 2023. Worship with your church on Sunday. I know we have some guests from other churches here, and so I'd encourage you, hey, worship with your church family. Uh, If you're here and you don't have a church home, we would love to be your church family. And so worship with us. We're here every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Read your Bible for at least 15 minutes a day, five days a week. Like, like this isn't scripture. I'm not giving you like the 11th commandment. I'm just saying, hey, like wisdom, you know, and we have a a Bible reading plan for you to do that. Uh, We also have our creative team every single week um, designing and putting a scripture memory card in your seat. Uh, I think the goal for every one of us is to take that and put it somewhere that you'll see it every day. Um, you know, meditate on that passage of scripture throughout the week. Memorize those passages of scripture. We, we kind of curated ones that we feel like would be very helpful for your walk with the Lord. Um, have a one-on-one accountability relationship with another Christian. Somebody you meet with every other week, once a week, once a month. Just say, hey, how, how's, it, how's it going? What are you excited about? What are you discouraged about? What's God teaching you? Um, invest in a relationship with a non-believer. Begin to invest, praying for them, sharing the gospel with them, whatever the next step is in that relationship. Um, Give generously from your income on a recurring basis. Be someone who is generous, giving of your time, treasures, and talents. Uh, Take a 24-hour break from your vocation once a week. You need a weekly reminder that Jesus is seated on his throne so you can rest. So I I know for some of you, you're like, that's impossible. Maybe start with a six-hour break from your vocation once a week, right? Christ established the the Sabbath rest for our good. Um, Serve on a serve team at least once a month. We want you to be able to use the gifts that you have. We don't don't have sidelines here at the Oaks. Uh, We're all in on this. Um, Consider how you can contribute to the global mission of God. Maybe that's going on one of our mission trips that we'll have this year. Uh, Maybe that's going short term. Maybe you're about to graduate from college and you could spend two years on the field somewhere using your skills and vocation before you come back here. Um, Be a part of a missional community uh, every single week when they gather. It's really important for you to, uh, to be discipled alongside other people in a group. Why do we do this? Because Christ will return in the same way that he left. And our desire is to abide with him, to know him better with the time that he's given us here on the earth. So grateful for you guys. Let me pray for us and we'll take the Lord's Supper together.